through the screen. So yeah, um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Amanda Keysberry. I'm the Science and Stewardship Manager here at CFC. I've, I just hit my five year milestone in May. Um, I run a variety of our different projects. Um, the Beaver Reintroduction Project, if you've heard of, of that, um, I run that program as well as our lamprey work and our fire preparation work um, south of Mount Saint, uh, sorry, Mount Adams. Um, and then I also lead a lot of the volunteer trips throughout the summer. So I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces, those that have, that have been on other trips. Um, but we're happy to be able to do this independent volunteer opportunity. Um, I, we get questions about it all the time because we totally understand that folks can't dedicate you know, a whole weekend to come on our other volunteer trips. So we're happy to have something that folks can still get involved in a really impactful way, but um, that you can go and do it on your own time. Um, so yeah, if, if any of you have done Cascades Pika Watch, or there's also Pika Patrol, there's Peaking for Pika, there's every clever name you can think of. Unfortunately, I didn't come up with a clever name for us. Um, but we're just piggybacking off everything that they've done and all of their training materials and their survey protocols and all of that. So if you've done that training, this is exactly the same thing. Maybe you're like, okay, I don't need to sit and listen to this. Or maybe you'd like to have a refresher. Um, but if you have been a part of that at all, this is, this is one in the same. Um, we're just trying to help it fill in some data gaps because the current concentrations of survey efforts um, are kind of everywhere around here, uh, but not so much in Southwest Washington. So first, I just want to go over our training outline for the day, um, the day, the, the hour. It's not, <laughs> not going to be here all day. Um, and yeah, first, just talking about, you know, why we're doing this survey, these types of surveys. Why do we care about PICA? Why do we care about PICA and climate change? Um, Talk about the goals for doing these surveys specifically in Southwest Washington. I kind of just explained that there's a data gap. Um, then we'll go over just pica ecology, their physiology, their behavior, their diet, just give you a quick rundown of pica if you don't know too much about them. Um, then we'll get into the actual survey protocols. There's going to be two types of surveys, sitting surveys and opportunistic surveys, and I'll give you all the info on both of those. Um, then we're going to dig in to how to detect pikas and talk about maybe other animals that you might encounter or other sounds of animals you might encounter that might cause a little confusion. But the more and more I yeah think about this and listen to different animals, like it's pretty e easy to distinguish pikas, especially if you have binoculars. Um, then we'll talk about how to submit the data to us. Um, you can do it on paper when you're out there, but we'd like to get it in a digital format when you come back. Uh, then we'll open it for, you know, any questions that are still lingering. And then I'll talk about what's next. And I'm also going to pause for questions in between a lot of these sections because we're kind of going to be bouncing around a little bit. And I don't want you to lose your question because I'm sure it's going to be an important one. Um, so I should say any questions right now before we dig in. And please just turn off your, or unmute yourself and say something to me. It's just me running this and I have two screens for PowerPoint, so I'm not necessarily seeing the chat, I don't think. So please just interrupt me. Okay, great. Okay, so why study pika? Um, pika are an interesting species and in the fact that they're a climate change indicator species. Um, an indicator species is an organism, it can be bacteria or plant or animal, um, that reflects the condition of the environment around them. So they're often the first in their ecosystem to be affected by a particular environmental change, whether that's pollution or a warming climate or human development or any other kind of environmental degradation. And so by monitoring the behaviors or physiology, um, population levels of these indicator species, then scientists can actually monitor the health of its, that kind of whole environment ecosystem that that species lives in. So pika live in high elevation, alpine, mountainous areas, um, and they're already fairly sensitive to the climate. They have a thermal limit of around 75 to 
78 degrees, so they're not really active if it's warmer than that. Um, if it is, they're often retreating back in their rocks. So they, they kind of already have this sensitivity to climate. So in the face of climate change, the question is really like, okay, what's going to happen? You know, they're already up really high. Do they just keep getting higher and the mountain eventually runs out, right? We can't do a restoration project to add more mountain <laughs> for them to go up any, any higher. So they're an interesting species to study to just see, you know, what happens what happens when the climate changes and then vegetation changes and then maybe new predators come their way or the reduced snowpack um, that will be up in the mountainous regions uh, that will affect their ability to hide away in the winter um, and then just increases in extreme weather events. So this is a species that is definitely going to be <laughs> very affected by a changing climate. Um, and so that's why scientists want to get out there and, and learn as much as they can and kind of trace these populations over the years to see what they do. Um, it's also just a great fit for community volunteers. Pika are obviously a very charismatic, adorable species. So people like to turn their attention to them. Um, they're easily identifiable. So, I mean, it really, all it takes is we can do this online training and hopefully you do feel comfortable enough for identifying them once you're out there. Um, but it's one that you can look at a bunch of pictures and be like, okay, that's a pica, um, where other, th other things can have quite variation uh, in, you know, size, shape, whatnot, and doing something like this might not translate well when you're out doing it, but for pica, they don't change much, um, and that they live in really beautiful places. Um, so that means you get to go to beautiful places to do the surveys. Um, oh no, I got a call and that's making me nervous that someone is here. <laughs> Quick pause, so sorry. Oh, I'm actually here. Oh no. See, she said she had a lot of trouble finding parking and she can't find where to go. Oh. She'll go and watch the Zoom. I'm so sorry, Lisa. I'll contact you later. Um, anyway, so yeah, climate change indicator species, easy to study, great community volunteer project. Um, so that's why we wanted to come and be a part of it as well. And so specifically for FICA surveys in Southwest Washington, like I mentioned before, there's a bit of a data gap. So there's people up in the North Cascades doing pika surveys in Mount Rainier, and of course, I'm sure you've all heard of the Columbia Gorge pika populations, and if you haven't, they are an anomaly. They are pikas that live at the lowest elevation in all of the United States. Um, very interesting, and then obviously you throw in the Eagle Creek fire, and you get to study how they recover after fires, and so that's as awful as the fire was, it's posing an interesting experimental <laughs> design to see what um what pika are doing post fire um in a place where it's already weird that they're located so really cool um down in the columbia gorge but that's kind of left this gap in the giver pin show that there hasn't been any i, I think cascades pika watch people have trickled up in there but there's not been like a huge concerted effort to try to get as much as we can within the giver pin show and surrounding areas um I don't want to say Gifford Pinchot because there's plenty of mountainous areas outside of that. So like if you wanted to go to Silver Star, it's not the GP, but it's Southwest Washington where surveys aren't really being done. So that's also great. Um, and this just in general, we want to see what the populations are doing over time. So for the sitting surveys, I'll get more into this later, but we're revisiting the same spots each year. So we're trying to keep up with the populations that are there seeing if they're staying there or if they're leaving. And then, you know, you can throw in other variables of climate or any other things that are changing around there um, to try to draw conclusions about what could be happening to populations. Uh, and again, just as climate change indicators, it can help us understand the environment and ecosystem as a whole and maybe how it's going to affect other wildlife that's in that same ecosystem. So now we're doing a complete switch and we're just gonna start talking about pika and their habitat and their behavior and their diet, um, and then I'll open it up for questions after that. So this is the American pika. 
They're found all, all in the Western United States, of course, in alpine and mountainous regions at high elevations. And then of course, the anomalies like <laughs> populations in the Columbia Gorge. Um, so they're a small mammal in the lagomorph family. So they're actually uh, in the rabbit family. A lot of people think they're rodents or squirrels, but nope, they're little rabbits. So you can just throw some long, tall ears on them and maybe you can see it like, oh yeah, that definitely looks like a rabbit. Um, for a size comparison, I, you know, this is good to think about when you're surveying for them. They're either about the size of like a russet potato, it's like a big potato, a large hamster, or guinea pig. Um, also just like a human adult hand. You can kind of imagine like from my palm to the tip of my finger is seven inches. And you can see on this little diagram, they run about six to nine inches in length. So you can kind of just imagine like, hey, can I put that animal in the palm of my hand? You know, if you're seeing something scurrying along the talus and that's a good, uh, good sign that that could be a pica. Um, other features, they have a variety of fur colors, grayish to cinnamon brown. Um, conveniently for them, it blends in with the rocks. Inconveniently for us, it blends in with the rocks. So they can be hard to see if they're kind of just standing still um, on the rocks, but I'll let you know how we deal with that in, when we're doing the surveys. Um, another distinguishing feature are those giant ears that they have. People say Mickey Mouse ears. Um, there's a white margin around the ears. Uh, that's something, you know, you'd really have to have some good binoculars to see, but that's definitely um, a distinguishing feature they have. And the other thing that's big that helps tell them apart from other mammals that might be scurrying around is that they have no tail. So if you see something running around and it has a tail, it is 1000% not a pika. So that's a, that's a nice, good distinguishing feature to remember. I uh, just want to talk about the range a little bit and just throw on the map here where other um, of these pika monitoring efforts are being done. And you can see that there we have the big, big gap in Southwest Washington there. So all of that green and even the yellow are, is the habitat in which pika live. So you can see it lines up pretty perfectly with the Cascades. Um, and then we have a little bit in the Northeast Washington there. And so again, they're in the Cascades, they're in the rocky areas, they, they need rocks and they need vegetation. That's exactly what they're looking for when it comes to habitat. Um, so they don't burrow into dirt or anything, they strictly go into the crevices of the rock. And then when it snows, they're able to make tunnels in between the rocks where they can still access meadows and their hay piles. There's a little bit of specifics when it comes to the rock. It's not any rock um, or any rock pile, but the rocks need to be large enough so they can make those tunnels um, because they need to get back in there to protect themselves from warm temperatures or wind or all the precipitation that's coming down at certain parts of the year. Um, so what I've heard to look out for is that the rocks need to be at least the size of a basketball because something at that size, imagine all those like stacked up that that's gonna give enough area in between the rocks for the pica to move through uh, like they need to. And in addition to those rocks, there needs to be an abundant source of vegetation. Um, and the size, so pikas, they, they live in colonies but they kind of map out their own like individual territories and I've heard it ranging from honestly a very like small pile of rocks to like 700 meters square meters squared, which is like the size of a basketball court. So that's not something necessarily you need to like be considered. Just if there's if there's rocks on a slope and they're the size of a basketball, then then that's that could be an indicator that there's pica there. Um, I just want to show you a, a variety of rock slides and talus slopes um, that pika could maybe be in. So this is in the Tatouche range. Um, so talus, if you hear talus, talus slopes, that's just the pile of rocks that are accumulating at the base of the cliff. Um, so you can see here we have our cliff side and then, you know, just any weathering of the rocks, any geological shift that's just going to knock those rocks down. Then we just have the accumulation below. Um, so I, 
perhaps you guys have seen this out hiking places, just these really slopey areas with a variety of different sizes of rocks. Um, the next few photos are just going to be the proper size rocks with humans in them. So you can see a good for scale. And so all of these next photos are of people doing pica surveys. Um, so these are just the going to be examples of the types of rocks and areas that pica could live. And you can see here that there's a bunch of vegetation here. This isn't growing out of the ground. This is actually, oh, I'm, you're not seeing my mouth, sorry. Um, this is a hay pile. So this is an accumulation of food that the pica has um, built over the summer. And you can see that the vegetation growing out of the soil here, this is where they're going collecting and then bringing it back and putting it in these piles. And we'll get more into hay piles later. This is more for the rocks. Um, where I've experienced pica in the in the Gifford Pinchot, at least, is actually in the lava bed areas. So this isn't necessarily a pile of rocks because um, this is, you know, cooled magma and it's actually a pretty large rock. But when magma um, cools off, there's often air bubbles in there. And so that ends up being just empty space. So there's still crevices and stuff for pica to move in to um, to escape the elements. Um, so, yeah, I've definitely if you know where the lava caves are kind of near Fall Creek Falls, every time I go there, they're screaming at me. Um, so that's a place that I hope folks can go check out since there's not been any intentional studies done there, just me noticing. Um, so something to think about. So I guess it's not always rock piles <laughs> or like what you might think of as rock piles, but it can be something like lava beds. Um, here's just another example. I think this was probably in the North Cascades somewhere. Um, What's curious though, these rocks look like good sizes, but in this photo, we don't see any vegetation. So I hope that there's vegetation around because if there wasn't, then I would wonder, oh, are they really living here if there's not, you know, places for them to gather their forage. So, but again, we're looking more just to give you examples of, of rock size. Um, but on their diet, yeah, so they're herbivores. So they're feeding on grasses, weeds, wildflowers, mosses, shrubs. The thing about the Columbia Gorge pica is that they have access to food all year round and they have access to all the, the mosses on the rocks and stuff so that um, they actually don't create hay piles out there because they do have access to food all year round. Or if they do, they're pretty small. Um, so yeah, they're, they're obviously eating freely during the summer, but then they're also collecting uh, the different vegetation that they enjoy and storing those in hay piles. And then those will dry out and be preserved for the winter. Um, they also eat their poop as an additional uh, nutrient uptake. So very sustainable in that way. Um, as for their behavior, I mentioned they kind of had that thermal limit of, I, I've heard both 75 and 78 degrees, um, but if they're exposed to hotter temperatures than that, they can perish. So usually when we're doing these surveys, we need to make sure that we're out on days or out early enough in the morning that it's we're not reaching temperatures above 75 to 78 degrees because you likely won't see them because they'll be staying cool in their rocks. Um, so yeah, other things that they're doing when the temperature is right. So yeah, they're foraging around for food. So they're running around the rocks, collecting plants. Um, there's like a million photos out there of them with their mouths stuffed full with plants. They're super adorable. Um, they're also just establishing and maintaining their territory. So like I mentioned before, they live in these colonies, but they kind of do their own thing. Um, and they're territorial towards predators, but they're also kind of territorial to each other as well. Um, so they're kind of always running around defending their little swath of, of land. Um, they're of course watching for predators. They'll use their call if they're scared of a predator or us, if we're going to do these surveys, um, you often hear calls because they're alerting everyone else. Um, and then also if the temperature's right, um, and because they don't hibernate in the winter, um, they definitely will just lay out on the rocks and sun themselves. So these are different things that you could, you could see them doing. And again, we'll talk about that more when we're talking about detecting them, but this is just a brief, 
brief overview for you guys of physiology, diet, behavior. Oh, yeah, so that's all I have for right now. So, so any questions about this very quick and dirty uh, ecology lesson on pica? Oh, Abby, okay, I am seeing the hand thing. Uh, how, this is Gabriel, how far yeah. will they go for food? Yeah, I mean, I don't think they're expanding probably too far past that like 700 meters squared. I think things become too risky at that point for them to have to travel that far for food. So I imagine that's probably the upper limit of like size of area and like willing size of, you know, how far they might travel. But I don't, I, I don't know, like from the literature exactly or anything, um, but that would be my, my best guess. They also, you know, they're so tiny, they can only expend so much energy, right? So um, they're not, you know, moving around like elk or anything to go get food. Amanda? Yes. When you say they live in colonies, are they living in colonies, like sharing the tunnels and then like over a rock face, they have different territories where they're out looking for vegetation? Yeah, I don't see, I don't think it's much of the sharing of the tunnels. I think it's like, if we look back at this huge like talus slope area, like I feel like the colony would be like, okay, the colony is all within S73, but like the individual territories is probably like, say there's four pica, it would be like quadrants. I don't think they're really crossing over into each other's territory. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Also, who knows what they're doing under those rocks? I mean, I don't know that that's even that well studied because yeah, I'm sure there are some scientists that are getting up in there. We're not doing that. I've never done that. Um, so that could be more well known than I'm saying, but I I'm pretty sure that they stay pretty separate. They get pretty feisty with each other, or, you know, they when you hear the calls, that's sometimes what ha what's happening is it's like, get out of my, get out of my space. Okay, so now we're just gonna jump into what does this volunteer job even entail? If you have been a part of Cascades Pika Watch or Pika Control, you probably have some idea, but everyone else, you're like, okay, great, Pika, now what? Um, so now I just wanna talk about the surveys and what they entail. So for any of these things that you're doing, um, whether it's sitting surveys or opportunistic, I'm wanting you to attend the training, which all of you are doing and anyone that's hearing this recording later is doing. So great, check that box. Um, for just the sitting surveys, so sitting surveys, I'll touch on a little bit so it's not too confusing as I'm talking about it right now. Um, sitting surveys, you're going back to locations where pica have already been seen. Um, and I said like, oh, there's a data gap. We don't really know anything, except there's people out there that love iNaturalist and there's people out there that go and look for different things and put on iNaturalist. So I'm actually using iNaturalist data because it's available to the public. And that's really serving as our baseline data for these sitting surveys. Um, so for those, you'll get access to the map and you will sign up for a particular survey site. Um, also, if you're doing sitting surveys, we would like you to fill out our liability waiver that um, our other volunteers normally fill out. We're not going out with you, but you are doing this for us. Um, so we would just like you to fill that waiver out. For opportunistic, that kind of is you just going out on your own and you just happen to be sharing the, the data with us if you find something. Um, so it's just for sitting surveys. Um, we also just want you to follow the data collection protocols, which I will go over shortly. Um, something again, I guess this is more with the sitting survey, since you are doing it for us, we would like for you to hike with at least one other adult. Um, I get for like the opportunistic surveys where you're kind of just going out on your own and, you know, people solo hike. I feel like I can't tell you that you have to bring someone if you're doing that, but I'm just a huge proponent personally of going out with someone else. Um, 
So yeah, if you're doing the sitting surveys for us, I would really, really, really like for you to bring someone else out with you. Um, and then when you're done with your site visit, whether it's sitting survey or opportunistic, we just want you to try to get that data back to us as quick as possible. So we know that that site's been visited and we, you know, there's only 44 sites right now. We had 55 people signed up for this training. Of course, not everybody's going to end up doing it, but you know, if there's sites available and people wanting to do it, we want to know that. So you just getting your data back to us as soon as it's done is, is really helpful. Okay, so more into the nitty gritty of what each of these surveys are. Um, so the sitting survey is again, surveying areas that have previously known PICA occupancy. So you will see the map, you'll see what these points are. You can shoot, you know, maybe you were headed to Goat Rocks Wilderness this summer anyway, and you see that there's a couple of points along a trail that you wouldn't mind going to. Then maybe those are the ones you sign up for, or maybe you have no idea where you wanna go, but you see one down by the Wind River and you're like, oh, that's cool, let me sign up for that one. So you'll get to choose where you wanna go. And so you'll get the GPS coordinates. Um, all of these sites, since they're just, you know, people putting data on iNaturalist, they're all along trails or on roads. There's no bushwhacking for these. Um, so it should be pretty easy to get to these locations. There should be trailheads and parking spots. And of course, if you need help figuring out how to get there, I will certainly help you. Um, but I imagine that a lot of these, you put in the GPS coordinates on Google Maps and it's gonna get you the easiest path there for sure, or at least to the trailhead. Um, so yeah, you'll, you'll get to your spot, um, and you'll want to sit or stand, um, in a safe spot along the trail or road, wherever you are, and you're going to sit slash stand for 20 minutes, just at the bottom of the talus slope. And you're just going to look up into the talus slope. And you're going to be really quiet. So if you're out there with, um, other folks, another person, um, you want to be really quiet. So that's kind of the point of sitting there for 20 minutes is kind of just letting everything settle. You could have easily scared the pike if they're there by coming up. So just kind of sitting still, standing still, just waiting to see if they're curious and like pop back out or listen to see if they're like yelling at you because they're mad that you're there. Um, and 20 minutes, that's just what everyone else does uh, for the sitting survey. So we're copying that so our data can be shared with everyone else. So we can have a really robust data set and say that, okay, everybody did this exact same thing um, to do this survey. So sit for 20 minutes, you look, you listen. Again, binoculars, super helpful. I understand that everybody might not have a pair of binoculars and you don't necessarily need to go and invest in them if you wanna do these surveys because one, you can just hear them. And two, you know, if you just, focus and are scanning the talus a bunch and looking for them running around, I mean, there's still a very good chance that you could see them with just your eyes. Um, another thing about the sitting or standing, again, you want to do that from the trail of the road. You don't want to go into the talus. Um, it's just unnecessary. It's pretty dangerous or can be pretty dangerous. You could be disturbing the pica more than you need to. So definitely just stay on trail on the road. Um, and then if you if you see or hear a pica before that 20 minutes is complete, um, you can actually be done with the survey because the survey is presence or absence. So once you acknowledge that there, or sorry, once you know that there is a presence of pica, then that's kind of it. Just staying there longer and hearing the same pica um, doesn't really give us much more information, but feel free to sit that whole time. I mean, maybe another pica does pop up. Maybe you're you're hearing one calling from this way and then all of a sudden you hear something from that way, then maybe you can conclude that there's two pica there. So maybe the, there is some new information that you you find out, but for the most it's just presence or absence. And so after that 20 minutes, if you don't hear or, or see anything, then that's declared, you know, there's an absence of pica there. So these are just the questions that you'll answer while you're there. Very, very simple. Did you see or hear pica? Um, you're going to write down your latitude and longitude. Um, you're gonna write down the temperature outside, uh, the weather conditions. So very simple, you know, sunny, cloudy, rainy, whatever. There's gonna be a list of options for you to choose from um, survey start and end time. So again, we just wanna verify that you're, you're doing 20 minutes and that'll help you think about it too. Um, 
of just doing it for 20 minutes at most. And then take a photo or video um, of the site, regardless if you see pica or not. Um, and then if you do see pica and you maybe do have a good camera or, I mean, even cell phone cameras are getting crazy on their zooms, you can attempt to take a photo of the pica as well um, and just send us that if you're fine with us having those. So when you're out there, you know, th there's some applications you can use to collect data that allow you to work offline. Um, we're not using one of those for this. We really just wanted to mimic what uh, Cascades Pika Watch and Pika Control and everybody else is using. So it's easier to share data. I'm kind of hoping by next year we can kind of integrate more. Um, so I will note that if you've done Cascades Pika Watch and you've used their form, that if you do these with us, there's actually a different form. It, it's also Google Forms, but we just want to be able to, I want to be able to track what you guys are doing, but also be able to share it with them. We just didn't have time to work together this year to like integrate that better, but I'm hoping it can be like a whole, you know, cascades wide. We're doing all the same thing um, with technology that you can actually collect the data on your phone or an iPad or something without needing service. So the easiest thing to do right now for these is that I will send you a PDF of this paper copy. You can just throw it in your backpack with a pencil and do it that way. Or you can even like write notes on your phone if you remember what categories of data that you need, um, whatever works best for you. So I'm kind of gonna give you all the options and you can figure out what you like to do best. But the simplest way is to just carry this piece of paper whip it out when you do the survey, fill it out. And then when you come back, you will turn it in to, well, honestly, you could like send a picture and send it to me and then I'll fill out the Google form or you can go and fill out the Google form. Um, so yeah, just kind of a step-by-step -step overview for the sitting survey. So you'll sign up for a site. I'll be sending a Google sheet out. I'll be sending everything. Like I'm talking about so many things and I know it sounds like a lot but it'll be all nicely condensed and packed for you in an email and hopefully very easy to understand. Um, so I'll send up the sign up sheet next week along with the map so you can see where these sitting surveys are. Um, you'll definitely wanna plan that route to get to the site. And again, I will help you with that if you're unsure of where the trailhead might be to even get to that point or if you're concerned about a road closure. I mean, I know about some of those things, but. Also, you can always call the Forest Service if you're going on Giver Pincher land um, to make sure all the roads are open. You know, if it's a place that you've never been or maybe a place that's not so popular, we're just getting out of the winter, right? There's often a lot of roads closed, either still because of snow or hazard trees or something. So it's always good to check if you're going to a new place. Um, again, the temperature is really important. Obviously, when you get up, you know, it can be warm in Portland or Vancouver. Um, but once you get up to the mountains, it is a little cooler. So make sure to try to check temperatures uh, in the cities that are closer to the mountains or even, you know, there's some temperature gauges at um, different sites within the forest that you can check into to see if it would be a good day to go surveying. Um, along with the temperature, ideally it wouldn't be raining because I think they like to escape from the rain. So they would just be in the rocks while you're out there looking for them. Um, again, collecting the data on the paper and then uploading it to the Google form when you get back. Um, and we'd really just like people to commit to, you know, one of these sites per summer. And obviously that can change from summer to summer. But it, yeah, any data is invaluable if you want to do one trip, if you want to do five trips. Everything is welcome. Um, we just really appreciate it and, and need a bunch of people to go and do this to get a good set of data. So um, anything you feel like doing. Okay, so that's the sitting surveys. So again, go into some place that has already has known presence of pica. And it's within the last, so the iNaturalist data, I noticed it ranged from probably like 2018 to this year. So, so that's totally fine. It, it, the starting point's not huge. Just it's a good place for us to start without not really having any other way to do that. So we'll, we will take what we can get there. Um, for the opportunistic surveys, this is just, if you're out on a hike and you hear a pika or you see a pika, then let us know. And all we need for that is the GPS coordinates. Um, 
if you heard or saw it, I mean, if you knew that you saw like three or if you could tell that you heard more than one, as much information as you can give us, but um, the, the, the minimum is the GPS coordinate <laughs> and if you saw it or heard it. So with this, there's no need to plan with us. Um, maybe just keep, so there's a different survey sheet for the opportunistic. Maybe you have that in your backpack just from now on, just in case. But again, we'll just take the GPS coordinates and that's fantastic. Um, even just taking a photo of the site. I mean, again, maybe you don't see the pike in the photo, but just taking the photo of the site, sometimes um, you might have this on on your phone where uh, the metadata has the GPS coordinates. So that's literally all you would have to do is take a photo and we'd have as much as we needed because that would give us the time and the date and everything. Um, if you don't have your photos tied to geospatial data, you could probably, even without service, yeah, I think you can open up Google Maps and like leave a pin um, if you needed to, a little label. Um, and again, yeah, just noting what you saw slash heard, how many you saw, how many you heard. Um, and just like the other surveys, if you can upload it to a Google form when you're back in service, that's great. Um, again, if you just sent me the GPS coordinates, I'll fill out the rest, whatever is easiest for you. So, um, so yeah, and you know, it's not gonna be any hike you go out on, right? So, so maybe it's like, oh, I'm going to Mount Adams or Mount St. Helens or to Goat Rocks Wilderness or to the lava beds. Oh, that could be a place that there could be hike, pika. So maybe I keep that in mind and maybe I tuck in my survey sheet uh, for going on those hikes. And as you're walking along and maybe you don't hear anything, but you, you see talus slopes or something, and not that it would technically turn into an official sitting survey, but maybe you could kind of just pause for a second and be like, oh, I'm just gonna check out to see if anything pops out. You can do that too, but it would still just be GPS coordinates, photo, what you saw or heard. Yeah, and I just wanna go over, I feel like all you guys, know this, you're probably seasoned hikers, you've probably been out there, you've done this, but just want to run over this kind of stuff. You know, if you have a medical emergency, calling 911 is not always the answer, but if you're in the middle of the forest, I feel like you're getting more and more service out there. Every time I go out, I feel like I have stronger cell service, um, so I always check that first. Um, I always advise carrying a, you know, like a Garmin inReach or something if you have one. Um, of course, just bring all the safety equipment, your 10 essentials, more than the 10 essentials is great. Um, hiking with a partner, ensure some extra safety. It's always good to tell someone else when you're leaving, when you're coming back. If you want that person to be me, I'm happy for you to send me that information if you just want to let me know when you're going. You don't have to do that. Um, again, once you sign up for that survey, I'm just imagining that you're going to be doing it soon and you're going to let me know when you've done it. But if you want to tell me that you're going out on a particular day, then I will make sure to check back in with you at the end of the day and ensure that you came back. Um, again, for those sitting surveys, you don't need to go up in the talus. You need to stay on the trail. Um, yeah, we don't want you going off trail anyway. Um, even if it wasn't the talus, you know, staying on trail is ideal. Um, if a site feels unsafe for any reason, if it's like, oh my gosh, there's a bunch of trees down in the trail, we could climb over them to get to this spot, but I'm, you know, kind of nervous to do that. Don't do it. There's no data that's worth anyone's safety or feeling safe. Um, I know it's a bummer if you do go, you know, so far and you're making your way there just to go do this survey and have to turn around that that's a bummer. But again, it's your safety is way more important. Like my my ethos of these volunteer trips is safety and then fun. Um, so if you feel unsafe for any reason, please turn around, do not survey, and just let us know that you couldn't do the survey. Um, and if it's things that are more like the road is closed or the road is washed out, um, it would be nice if you just let us, yeah, know that so we can, you know, talk to the Forest Service to see if that's going to be fixed or if we just need to take that site off the list because it's a bridge that collapsed and the Forest Service isn't going to fix it in the near future. Um, and when you're at trailheads and stuff, just a good thing to keep in mind that I'm sure most of you know is just not keeping any valuables in your car. 
Um, people like to stake out trailheads, unfortunately, and take things from people's cars. Um, again, equipment checklist. I'm just going to keep nailing in that you need to have a hiking buddy, or I prefer you have a hiking buddy. Um, the 10 essentials is always fantastic. So navigation, sun protection, insulation, um, a flashlight, first aid, matches or lighter, um, repair kit for your other equipment, extra food, extra water, and an emergency shelter. Um, again, binoculars will really help, um, but it's not a make or break. Um, definitely have those directions to the site um, laid out well for you. And then you need a GPS device and a camera, which smartphones are both of those. So if you have a smartphone, then you'll be able to do those two things. Um, but if not, then you'll definitely need some sort of GPS device um, and camera to take a photo and get the coordinates. So that's a lot. <laughs> um, and again, it'll all be laid out in email if you feel like your head's swirling about the different surveys and whatnot. But for right now, does anybody have questions about the sitting survey or the opportunistic survey? and what needs to be done for those. Hi, it's Julie. Hi, Julie. Hi, Julie. Um, is there a problem with multiple people signing up for the same sitting site? Yeah, so with the map and um, Google Sheet, uh, that should keep people from signing up for the same site. Um, so yeah, ideally we would just have one group of people, you know, you and your hiking buddy or you and your hiking partners, um, going to the site per year. Good question. Thank you. Amanda, Bob here. Hey, Bob. Hi. When will we be, we, when will we be able to sign up? Yeah, next week. So Joanna Varner, which is one of the main PICA people is helping me mimic their um, sign up sheet. She did this really fancy thing where if you like, like once you turn in your Google form, it like fills out the Google sheet, but you can also use it as a sign up sheet. And she's preparing that for me right now. Um, and she's a very busy lady. So um, hopefully I, I think we'll have everything to everybody by next Wednesday. Okay, cool. So now I want to get back into just detecting them and really what we're looking out for um, and going over the pika calls and calls of other animals and appearance of other animals that you could encounter. Um, I feel like this often, like when I've done this training, I feel like it just made me feel more confused. Um, so I will you know, send all the YouTube links that I'm going to show you so you can kind of listen on your own time too. And, you know, once you're out there and you're hearing something and it's kind of the same, I, it, you know, it can definitely be tough, but I, I'm hoping to show you that, uh, that pikas are pretty darn distinguishable by other things. And there's going to be these other little factors where it's like, oh, we're looking, you know, right here and this looks really the same, but it, there might be a caveat of like, oh, well, this species is nocturnal. So you, you wouldn't confuse it with this species. So we're just going to go over this. Hope it doesn't add more confusion uh, or any confusion. But again, you'll be able to look over everything later if you're not feeling confident after this. So just more about their appearance. Um, so yeah, size is definitely an indicator about the size of an adult hand or russet potato. Um, it's kind of the shape of a potato too. Their fur is gonna be really variable. I mean, even from these three photos, you can see that there's differences. That one at the top is really light. Uh, the, the territorial pica kind of has a lot of mottled color mixed like tricolor. And then the pica at the bottom, it's kind of like a mix of brownish on the rear and kind of more cinnamon. Um, and yeah, so it is gonna, it's gonna blend in with the rocks a bit. So I feel like it's kind of unlikely. I mean, unless you have the binoculars, you're really gonna hope that the pike is moving around because I think that's how you're gonna notice it the easiest um, besides the call. But if we're doing appearance, um, it moving around or like something moving around with a bunch of stuffed vegetation in its mouth is going to be the way that you see it. If it's just hanging out, it might not be totally obvious. So yeah, 
things to keep in mind more so are probably the ears. Um, you can see in some instances the ears are are up, so maybe that's visible to you. Um, and then again, absolutely no tail is there. So any other creature you see with a tail, not a chance that it's a pika. Um, these pictures are just showing kind of like the different shapes that they can be in. So I don't think the pika aren't going to be cold this summer. So this would kind of be surveys later in the year. But when a pika is cold, it definitely bundles up and kind of almost turns into a circle. So that's kind of just a shape you could look for in the rocks. Um, the territorial pika is going to be kind of up at the tip top of a rock and yelling like this. Um, so maybe you can see that kind of popping out above the rocks. But again, that's more so going to be hearing it. Um, this is something you could definitely encounter, but yeah, it would be tough if they're not moving. They kind of splay out, you know, like our dogs or cats would when it's hot and to try to cool themselves off. Um, so this, this warm pika is like a summer pika stretched out on the rocks, but that could almost make it more difficult because then they're, they're closer to the rocks than normal. Um, so yeah, this is just so you can see, you know, different body shapes. Um, and that, yeah, it'll definitely be easier if they're at like the tip top of rocks and not too far in. So yeah, you might see them running across the rocks, perched on the rock and eating. Eating is interesting. This is something I learned recently, actually, is that, you know, like squirrels will sit up on their hind legs and kind of like eat with their hands. Beaver do too. Yeah, a lot of things in the rodentia family or squirrel family do that, but pikas don't do that. So if you see a creature like sitting on its butt and hind legs and like chewing on vegetation, likely not a pika. They'll definitely have stuff like stuffed in their mouth, but they're not like working it in with their hands. Okay, so the calls. We're about to do a series of videos and it might sound all like nothing to you. So that's why I'm sending you these YouTube links later so you can listen again. So pikas have two types of calls. They have short calls and they have long calls and they both sound very squeaky. Um, the short calls are going to be uh, to warn other pikas of predators and to just defend their territory and protect their food like between pikas. So this is the short call. This is gonna be, I have a TV screen up here as my second screen. I tested this earlier, but um, Somebody let me know if you can't hear this. And there might be some silence at first because the pika just doesn't, you know, start right when the video starts. So let's see. Do we hear that? Amy, I'm seeing you. Can you give me a thumbs up if you, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so that one was actually two. I don't know if y'all heard that first one because it was definitely quieter, but you can first hear a pika off in the distance. And then this one in the in the shot is responding to that. So that's, that's gonna be a, a way for you to determine, you know, maybe there's more than one pika is if you kind of hear one coming from this direction and coming from this direction, or you're seeing one and, it opens his mouth, the sound comes out, and then you hear another sound. Um, so yeah, let's just play this again. Hopefully you heard the far away one. And then he's responding, or she. So yeah, it's a very squeaky, almost like dog squeaky toy sound. <laughs> um, very high pitch and shrill squeaky. Um, there's also long calls. So these are often to attract mates, but so it's males typically doing that, but also in the autumn, they kind of just like to sing. I'm not totally sure the scientific reasoning behind that, um, but that's the long calls. And yeah, these are interesting. And when you first hear it, you're like, oh my gosh, that just sounds like any other bird. But the, the kicker for this long call is like at the end, it kind of sounds like they're just like giving up. It's like they went really hard on the long call to like keep it going. And then they're kind of just like, eh. so the, the, we'll, we'll hear that one here. That's a short call. 
And now he's about to. It's like a dying squeaky toy. <laughs> And there's just that final, like, ah, like I've said all I can. Um, oh, and now he's just going with the short calls. Um, I've personally never heard a long call out in the wild. I've just heard the short calls, which I feel like are a little easier to tell, but that, that's what that one sounds like. So again, at the end, it's like he almost like ran out of breath and he's just like, ah, the last little, little sound comes out. Okay, so now we're going to talk about what they could be confused with. And in the Cascades Pika Watch training, I did, I feel like they gave a lot of examples. Um, but I feel like this is really the only one that sounds pretty darn similar. Um, and it's a bird. So you're not going to confuse it by appearance. And the nuthatch isn't necessarily going to be hanging on the talus, but they hang out in coniferous forests, which are often near these talus slopes. So there could be a chance that there's one around, depending on where you are. But something to think about too is if you hear the sound coming from the trees, then it's very likely not a pika because the pika are definitely in the rocks. But of course, when you're out there, you know, things can get weird and you might not really be able to detect where the sound's coming from. But I just want to play this. This one's a little quieter. Let me see if I can turn this TV up. Um, but I feel like it kind of has similar like cadence as the pika, but it sounds more like a honk than a squeak. So curious to see what you guys think. I really hope you can hear this one. I'll try to turn the mic that way too. Y'all hear that? like honky, no more like hm, hm. the pike is like eep, eep. again I'll send all these videos um but yeah out of the ones that I've seen on the other trainings I really feel like it's only that one but I am going to play a few others um because it'll kind of be the combination of like seeing these creatures and the sound that could throw you off um let's see yellowed belly marmot so these are definitely creatures that like to hang out in talus as well um but they look pretty different um they're much bigger they have a big bushy tail so you know if you see that tail and that's a good indicator this is kind of the size difference i try to like scale this down so like a pika would be this size compared to a marmot so quite a bit bigger um and their call is like super high pitch so there'd really be no there'd really be no confusion i don't think here so i'm going to play it anyway very high pitch like piercing almost and very quick and short so i feel like there's not a huge worry there you, you might see something scurrying around and it could be a marmot but if you can get a good look and see that tail then you should feel good that it's not a pika. Next, we have a Townsend chipmunk. I feel like this and the golden mantled ground squirrel is like the animal that I see the most in the Giver Pincho National Forest. So it's kind of why I wanted to include it. I think I have seen it near rocks, um, kind of south of, of Mount Adams. But of course, Looking at it here, you can be like, oh, that looks really different. But again, out there, if it's running around far away, um, it might be hard to tell. But of course, we have these, this, these stripes going down. We have a big bushy tail. They're quite a bit smaller. Um, and their call is kind of fun, kind of weird. I, I didn't expect it, actually. Like, I feel like I've heard that in the woods before and would have never thought it was a chipmunk. So it's much, I'd say that's 
that's pretty darn different. There's no, there's no squeakiness to that for sure. Um, but these, th these guys are running around, guys and girls are running around everywhere. So just thought I'd mention it. Same with the Douglas squirrel, also everywhere, but mostly in trees. Um, so I feel like this isn't something you would encounter on the talus. Um, but again, just something to keep in mind, but they have that, you know, super orange underbelly. They're a bit bigger than um, pica. And, and again, we'll be up in trees. So I guess you could hear the call um, if there's trees around the talus slope, but um, their calls, I'd say if, if there's anything that's calling that's annoying you, it's the Douglas squirrel <laughs> because they are just relentless. Um, they just start and keep going until you leave the area. So, and do all sorts of different stuff. Um, so it is kind of squeaky, but it almost sounds more like an annoying alarm that like won't go off or that you can't seem to turn off. Um, and yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> There's other, so we do some like huckleberry monitoring surveys and I swear like half the plots that we go to, there's just Douglas squirrels above us yelling at us the whole 15 minutes that we're there. Um, so yeah, again, they're, they're likely not gonna be on the talus. Um, and these are the last few that I wanna talk about. Um, this bushy-tailed wood rat, I mean, looking at this picture, it's only one picture, but it kind of does look like a pika, right? Like with a tail, because it also kind of has like bigger ears. It's got kind of the same eyes and like face shape. So that would be something I'd be concerned about. But the big kicker with that is that they're nocturnal. Um, so you're not going to see them when you're out surveying during the day. And then of course that visible tail. Um, the bizarre mountain beaver. This is a weird creature to me. Um, I've never seen one. But the thing with them uh, is that they're mostly underground. So they dig tunnels underground and mostly hang out there like moles and stuff. And they have much, much darker fur and they're quite a bit bigger. Um, but you could, I mean, if that was crawling along some talus from far away, like maybe, but that's not going to be the case. Um, we have other little, little creatures from the rabbit family, the snowshoe hare and the mountain cottontail. Of course, they have giant ears um, and they don't normally hang out on talus, which is funny. I have pictures of them that they're like in rocks, but that's not <laughs> the same as talus. I'm, I imagine these are like roads or like uh, someone's yard or something. Um, but yeah, not typically on talus. The golden mantle squir ground squirrel, um, this picture is of it on talus. And like I said, that is one I've personally seen kind of running around everywhere in the Gifford Pinchot. Um, but hopefully you'd be able to see that striped fur and the visible tail to know that that's not a pika. Um, and again, yeah, large ears, not usually on talus. Um, so I hope that helps and doesn't confuse you because it's like, I do want to cover them because in the off chance you do see them, you want to just have that in your mind to really think about what you're seeing and hearing um, and thinking about, oh, wait, that looks like a rabbit, but would a rabbit be on at 8,000 feet in a talus slope? Like, no. <laughs> um, okay, so those are the, those were the direct signs. The appearance and the calls are direct signs of pica. But now there's the indirect signs, which are the hay piles and the scat. Um, so I mentioned before, they construct these huge food caches throughout the summer um, and until vegetation starts to die in the fall so they can have food throughout the winter. Um, it's usually packed in the rocks, but oftentimes it is kind of like spilling out and is very visible. So I've, I've seen a lot more hay piles than I've heard or seen pica. Um, this actually also doesn't guarantee or verify that there's presence of pica. Um, it is still good information for us to get. So on the sitting survey, there are check boxes for hay piles and scats, but unfortunately that data is not going to be used as like, oh, there's definitely a pica there. Um, to be able to definitively say that we need to see it or hear it, but it is still great information to know that perhaps they are there. Um, so the active hay piles are going to have a lot of green on them. Um, and it's going to be on top of some older stuff from the previous season. So this is a pretty good example. I'm going to show you some more 
that we definitely have that green fresh stuff and then piled on top of the brown kind of dried stuff that I guess they didn't need to eat in previous years. Um, and yeah, these things can get huge. They can be up to three feet wide, which is ginormous compared to the <laughs> six inch pica. Um, so yeah, here's just a couple more pictures. They can just be up on rocks like this. So this one's really not tucked away at all. Maybe it's a, they're piling it there and then they're going to take it in or something. Um, but yeah, you can see the green on top, the brown on bottom. And this is a, actually, I don't know the size of this because I don't really have anything to scale it on, but just a really good visual of the fresh stuff on the old stuff. So yeah, these are, these can be pretty obvious, right? On the rocks that are like gray and light brown. Green is going to stick out. Um, and you can, you'll be able to tell if it's, you know, vegetation growing out of the, the rocks versus it being piled up like this. And there's no need, you know, if you're out doing the sitting survey or even the opportunistic and you come across something and you're like, oh, I really can't tell. Should I climb the talus to go inspect it? No, it's okay. <laughs> you don't need to do that. Um, you should, especially with binoculars, you can tell. And I'd say it's pretty obvious um, when it's piled up like that. Like I've just been like driving and like seen it out of the corner of my eye and like stopped and was like, oh yeah. So that green, the greenness really helps. Okay, for scat. Um, so they have really tiny little poop pellets. They're about the size of peppercorns. Um, so this might not be something you see from afar, um, but I mean, maybe they're coming down to lower rocks to poop or something. And you do see that when you're sitting on the trail, who knows? Um, but yeah, the main thing is that they're peppercorn size, um, they kind of have different sites to use the restroom, but they will bring their pellets to their hay piles. Cause like I mentioned before, they do eat them. Um, so it's not always super, yeah, I feel like this, I almost shouldn't have even included this because this isn't going to be like a telltale thing or something really easy to find from the trail, but just want to mention that that's you know, something that could be out there. So just these really tiny little things. They're going to be up on the boulders as well. So maybe you see them with your binoculars. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think that's, so that's, that's it for the specifics of, of detecting them and kind of trying to give you a little more info as much as I can with us, you know, not being out there. So for now, any questions about detection and how to detect them directly by appearance or their calls, or maybe checking out the hay piles, Scott. Bob? Yeah, um, I th it seems like I've heard pika a lot more than I've seen them. Um, yeah. do, we, do we have any idea when people go to these sitting sites, how frequently they record um, the presence by either seeing it or by hearing it. And it seems to me like I hear them a lot. Yeah, for sure. I mean, since the data that we're starting with is just this iNaturalist stuff that, that wasn't anything formal that anyone was doing, that's kind of like those folks doing an opportunistic survey. You know, they were just out there and had an iNaturalist account and gave us that information. So I think for all of the sites, it's a mixture of site and calls or both. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? So yeah, I mean, it's it's just whatever whatever ends up happening. But yeah, I definitely hear them. I feel like I've seen one, but I've heard them countless times. Yeah, it just, just seems to me like they're, they're um, I'm aware of pika a lot. So I think if we go to a site after 20 minutes, it'll be pretty clear if they're there. And um, we're probably going to be um, pretty accurate. For sure. Yeah. And I, because yeah, it kind of, I've like slammed my door and one's like yelled at me, you know? Um, so I think, especially if you're going to a less traveled place and just kind of show up that they're, they're likely going to be making alar alarm calls at you. Um, and then also, yeah, sitting around and if it's really quiet, they might, you might be so lucky to see them pop out. <laughs> that gets me to another question, and um, this might sound kind of kind of mean spirited, but <laughs> could we elicit an alarm call by just throwing a pebble up into the rocks? Um, 
maybe but yeah let's not do that oh. um but i get your point for sure i mean i think our presence and again like i said especially if you're with other people and you're talking or something they're, they're going to hear you and notice you um especially if they were out doing stuff beforehand too, they're gonna see you coming. So I don't think we need to activate them. <laughs> Actually, another, uh, yeah, another quick question. Um, if they perceive our presence, are they more likely to, to give an alarm call um, and then be quiet? Or are they more likely to be quiet? Or are they almost always likely to give an alarm call? That's a good question. From my experience, I feel it's like an immediate, like immediate call when I've made a sound yeah. like they're like on top of it and then yeah, yeah there's a bit of you know them them waiting around and maybe there's other pika that are calling back um so they're kind of like talking to each other but um yeah I'm, I'm sure it's different for every every scenario but from my experience they've been really quick to to say something when I, they don't want me there Sarah, I see your hand raised. Hi, yeah, just a quick question. So the main goal of the surveys is to document presence. You don't wanna know how many pikas are in a particular area or anything like that. That's a good question. No, we do. Um, I guess I didn't say that specifically when I was going over the, um, what you're writing down on the form. Um, but yeah, so it's PICA detected, yes or no. If yes, by what sign, then you can answer site calls, hay piles or scat, or maybe it's all of those, maybe it's two of those. And then we do ask how many PICAs did you detect? That can obviously be very difficult in some situations. Um, so yeah, just doing the best that you can um, for the calls, just like we kind of heard in that video, you could really tell that one was coming from somewhere else and one was coming from the one in the shot i mean obviously we were seeing it happen too but that could easily happen when you're out there that you can hear something coming from this way and coming from that way and it's safe to say that there's at least two okay thanks and just one other question for the sitting surveys uh do you leave after 20 minutes or you can you said up to 20 minutes but are, is these are they time limited so that you know yes. how long the observation so leave after 20 minutes exactly so yeah you only want to do up to 20 minutes but if you do see or hear pika before that then it's like yep they're here um and that's that's the data that they're looking for and so to keep everything consistent and for them to do particular analysis and stuff we're just sticking with that 20 minutes because they're saying that okay 20 minutes we didn't hear anything that is considered an absence. Even if you did hang out for an hour and you happened to hear them, but that's just, that's not data that they can use since they're using a really particular protocol, if that makes sense. Right, thanks. I was yeah. wondering about the protocol. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, great. Again, you'll have this recording. And um, yeah, well, I guess I'll just talk about everything else that's next after this, because that's all I have for, for, the, for the training. Um, so I want to get you that email by June 15th. I think that's next Wednesday, if I time that out correctly. Um, okay, great. So yeah, you will receive a bunch of things from me. So you'll receive a link to the map of the sitting survey locations. This is a glimpse of that I have in this slide. All those little suns are spots that pika have previously been recorded. And again, it's just by these iNaturalist folks. And they range from, you know, people doing this as a, as a hobby. And some of them are actually research grade. Um, so that's just kind of interesting to note. But yeah, so that's where those came from. And that's just going to give us a good starting point. But as you guys, hopefully some of you are going out to do these opportunistic surveys, or you know, you're just keeping it in mind when you're going hiking and you can collect more points for us. So anything opportunistic that you collect this year will be turned into a sitting survey next year. So we do the sitting surveys are great. Like we definitely need those, but we totally need the opportunistic stuff as well. Um, so we can just make everything more robust.
So you'll get the link to the map of the sitting survey locations. Um, you'll get a link to the Google Forms, both for sitting and opportunistic. You'll get a PDF version of both if you want to print those off and bring them with you. Again, if you just wanted to go through and write, so again, it's not a lot of stuff. I'm very far from the web camera here. You can't see that at all. Um, you know, it's only like eight bits of data. So if you just wanted to type notes on your phone, you know, type out all the all the categories of information that you need and just fill it on your phone. Like that's great too. Um, however you want to gather that when you're out there. Um, I'm going to send you a recording so you can go back to this if you think that that's going to be helpful. Cascades Pika Watch also has some stuff on YouTube as well. I will send you those links because I am certainly not trying to reinvent the wheel with what they're doing. I'm just mimicking it. Um, so if you watch any of their stuff, it's all the same things. They probably have little bonus information because a lot of those folks are like PICA experts, which I am not. Just an enthusiast and just want to help fill in this data gap. Um, so you could easily learn some additional things from them. Nothing, you know, absolutely necessary for the surveys, but just fun PICA facts. Um, for those of you who are listening to the recording for the first time, so that's none of you on the Zoom right now, but I am going to give them a quiz just to ensure that they've They've watched and uh, downloaded the most important info. And again, just a YouTube link to some more PICA calls. And then maybe you can just listen to those on repeat before you go out, just that really ingrained in you. So that when you go out, um, maybe you can feel a little more confident about that's what you're hearing. But I'd say it's, I'd say it's pretty darn obvious when you're out. I just feel like it is. It's just so squeaky. It's like if you have a dog and you go and step on their squeaky toy, like it really is similar to that. Um, so yeah, so that's that. So you'll be hearing from me on Wednesday. If anything happens to where I can't get you all that stuff, I will let everyone know, but um, it'll definitely be Wednesday. And from there, you can start signing up um, and you can start going out whenever. I mean, even the opportunistic stuff, if you were going on a hike tomorrow, I feel like you have enough information um, to you know keep your eyes peeled for Pika on that hike. So yeah, you could get, you know, Get started early. If you're doing the opportunistic, you obviously need more info for the sitting surveys. Hey, Julie, you can go ahead. Um, I have a question about the sitting surveys. If we didn't sign up for one of them, but we just happened to be near one, can we do the observation or not? Yeah, I mean, I guess that wouldn't hurt anything in the off chance that someone already did it. You know, it, it's not the worst thing in the world and it's only 20 minutes of your time so i'd say yeah if you like knew that there was a spot but you didn't sign up for it and you happen to be passing it yeah it's definitely not the end of the world anybody else and i'm of course going to be available for you know questions via email and when you start to dive in to actually do this stuff i can see that there would be more questions about certain things but I'm going to hopefully try to lay everything out for you perfectly so there's so there's not too many questions and that you can just get going when you want to. Just, Bob, Bob again here, just one real quick question. Yeah. You probably said this and I wasn't paying close enough attention, but the opportunistic survey is merely I'm going for a hike and I see habitat where there are pica and I see pica or hear pica. That's exactly it. Yeah, totally. And it, I mean, I feel like it helps maybe if you're thinking about their habitat, but like the the lava caves. I mean, I wasn't over there thinking that there'd be pica, but I just heard them and I was like, oh yeah, okay, I guess that makes sense. So yeah, it could be either way. It could it could be a surprise to you or you could be on a hike and be like, oh, there's talus slope. Like, I wonder if there's pica here. I might, you know, hang out for a second and just see. Again, that would not be the formal sitting survey, but that's just kind of the way you could, you could think about it because you like know what the habitat looks like. Okay, fantastic. Do one last call for questions. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so, so much for being here. Um, again, this is something I've been wanting to help with for like years now. Um, and I feel like there's always something that's kept me from doing that. So I'm really excited to try to get this going finally. And then, you know, once it's going, it's really just going to operate uh very simplistically and naturally because it's this independent study um that i don't necessarily have to lead but it happens and then we get all this data and it's really 
Fantastic. And now that we've done this and this is recorded, you can share this with your friends if they're interested. Um, and the this will be available to anyone who wants to do it and we can get more people to do it. So yeah, just thank you guys so much for being here. Um, we'll get everything next week. Ask me any questions you want. Um, and hopefully you guys will see some pica this summer and into the fall if you want to go into the fall. <laughs> All right, thank you, great. Andrea. Thank you great guys. Presentation. So thank yeah, you. Nice, nice, nice to meet you. Those of you that I haven't. Hey. Met. <laughs> thank you, Amanda. Okay, yeah, thank you so much, Jane. All right, see you all.